Well, good morning. So good to be worshiping with you all this morning. And thanks also to those of you who are tuning in to watch remotely. My name is Chad Barber. I'm senior pastor here at EP. If you are new with us this morning, if you've been visiting, if you're visiting for the first time or for the first several times, welcome. We're so glad that you could be worshiping with us this morning. If you would be so kind as to look into the back of the pew ahead of you, you'll find these little connect cards. If you would fill out your information to let us know that you worshiped with us, we'd be very grateful for that. Uh, we are continuing on in our sermon series in the book of Ephesians. And just a quick review, last week when we met, we talked about being filled with the Spirit. A very important passage as we go on into the next weeks because being filled with the Spirit, it enables us to be filled with joy, filled with gratitude for what God has done for us, but it also gives us the power to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And today we begin um, talking about the first relationship where we are submitting to one another in a marriage. And so what does it look like practically for submitting to one another in our marriage out of reverence for Christ? Well, that's what we're going to talk about later on in the service. But for now, I invite you in the next few moments as you hear the music playing to take a moment to read the reflection on the front of your bulletin, uh, meditate on Jesus, and prepare your hearts for worship. Please stand for the call to worship from Psalm 134. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Please remain standing for the next hymn on page three. Come now, almighty King, help us 
praise thy name to sing. Help us to praise, Father all glorious, sorrow all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, Let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is a God like you, O Lord, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. How manifold are your works, and wisdom have you made them all. When we look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the sun, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Lord, what is man that you care for us? We therefore draw near to you, believing that you exist and that you powerfully and bountifully reward those who diligently seek you. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants our soul for you, O God. Our soul thirsts for you, for the living God, who commands his steadfast love by day and at night his song is with us, a prayer to the God of our life. Your steadfast love is better than life. Come, almighty King, help us your name to sing and to praise you. Lord, help us to understand that our only hope is in trusting Jesus Christ who died in our place for our sins and was raised from the dead, that we might be clothed in his perfect righteousness author of grace and God of love, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Be with us as we continue to worship you now and as we prepare ourselves for the week ahead. As we listen to Pastor Chad proclaim your word, come, Spirit of holiness, and give your word success. For we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Each week as we gather to worship, we confess our faith using creeds and catechisms from the past. Today we're looking at Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 24 in the section 2 on marriage and divorce. Uh, this part of the confession helps us to understand the design of marriage for our partners mutual benefit to each other, uh, for our moral and spiritual character development, and for also our relationship with our children. Christian, what is the purpose of marriage? Marriage is designed for the mutual help of husband and wife, for the safeguarding, undergirding, and development of their moral and spiritual character, for the propagation of children and the rearing of them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Our Old Testament reading this morning is in two parts, from Genesis, the first chapter, the 26th and the 27th verse, and uh, Genesis, the second chapter, verses 18 to 24, found in the Pew Bible on pages 2 and 3, and also in the bulletin on page 4, Genesis 1:26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Chapter 2, eight, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is the last this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother, his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is the word of the Lord. In chapter 2, 1 and 2 of Genesis, everything looked good. But in Genesis 3, things changed. And sin, or, sin entered the world and changed our relationships with everyone among us. We all, therefore, are sinners. But we who are married probably sin more against our spouses, against our children, against our parents. 
uh, than in any other kind of sin. And as we look at how we should treat each other in today's sermon, we will be reminded again of our daily need to confess our sins. Let us as a body come together and confess our sins corporately and then you confess your individual sins. So pray with me. Father, forgive me. I am a sinner in desperate need of your grace. Forgive me for those moments when I fail to give others the grace you've given me. Forgive me for those times I want control rather than resting in your control. Forgive me for when I doubt your wisdom, mercy, and love. Forgive me for every moment when I am angry because I did not get my own way. Forgive me for those times I fail to witness to your rescuing grace. Forgive me for often loving earthly treasures more than the spiritual treasures you have lavished on me. Forgive me for those many moments when I have failed to love my spouse as you love your church. Knowing that my penalty has been paid, I come to you for what only you can offer. Please work to keep my heart tender and may my mouth always be willing to confess my need for your forgiveness. Forgive us, we pray you, most merciful Father, and free us from our sin. May we of all people be quick to repent and demonstrate to the world the love of Christ to others as he has loved us. Renew in us the grace and strength of your Holy Spirit for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. When we truly come and confess our sins, with broken and contrite hearts, God assures us of that forgiveness and a reminder of his faithfulness. We find that today in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And all of God's people said, amen. Each week we remind ourselves of our mission and our purpose here and some of what's going on. If you turn to page 11 in particular, we exist to change lives through sharing Christ, and we do that three ways. We gather as Christians to worship. We are discipled. We make disciples. We are discipled in our relationship with God and each other. And we send ourselves out as ambassadors as well as others as missionaries. Um, today, there's quite a few things just to, to highlight. Um, first of all, there is a choir concert coming up here on March the 10th at 7. It uh, looks like a really good concert. It's free. Um, look in the newsletter for all the details. Also, um, the women meet this week at 9 as usual. The men, we continue in our study in Romans 8 at 9 on, at 8 o'clock on Thursdays. I um, want to remind all of you of our winter 
Bible conference. It starts this coming Friday, on Friday evening. Um, all the details are also in the newsletter, but it starts Friday evening at 6 o'clock to 8, and then on Sunday, it'll be during the Sunday school hour as well as in our worship service. So I would encourage you to make plans to attend. It's a topic that is... Uh, you need to be able to discuss. And this is not just for adults, this is for children and for particularly junior high and high school as well. Um, these are the issues that are before us this day and we need to be w able to speak into them and to uh, talk to others about them. Uh, for the women, the Heritage Presbytery Annual Women's Conference is coming up on March the 18th. An early registration uh, deadline is today for you for that. and and the final um, registration then is March the 12th. Again, information is in the bulletin. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out also, and I think this is the best deal you can find, it's on a weekly, daily devotional uh, called Table Talk. Um, one of them looks like this for just one month, and it's 75 pages. It costs you $1 a month for this, and you can pay for it by the year. You can, um, it will start with you and it'll be delivered here and you'll get it every month. Uh, see Todd, there's a form out there to fill in for this, but it has daily devotions every day. It always has a theme. This was January's, the theme was peace. So the first articles were on peace. There's daily, it's working through the whole book of Luke this year. Um, there's scripture reading, there's the, um, talking about that particular scripture. There's other scriptures to look up that are part of that. There's even a, a, a table for daily reading through the scriptures if you want to do that. There's other articles. It's such an encouragement. This is the best dollar I think you can spend. And so $12, uh, see Todd about it, and you would start uh, getting this in April. And I, I don't get any kickback either, so it's, <laughs> it's just been a benefit to me in my own personal walk. Um, also, I really want to thank all of you for, your, for the Sunday mission uh, support there for the project that we had. It's again in the bulletin here, but you might miss it. But here's what our church donated to the Sunday mission. 26 pillows, 108 color white cloths, 142 whitewash cloths, 36 sheet sets, 105 towels, and six pillowcases. And that was a great help for the Sunday mission. And so thank you for your, um, for your support of that and for our supporting the Sunday breakfast mission as well. Um, one final thing in case you haven't heard, um, our <laughs> beloved Roberta Smithhurst died yesterday. And um, I just uh, wanna take time to pray for her, for her family, uh, for Bill and for Debbie. Um, I don't know any details about the funeral yet, but we'll let you know as soon as they're available. Let's pray. O oh God, whose days are without end and whose mercies cannot be numbered, we give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love to our dear friend Roberta. Merciful Father, it was your pleasure to take your servant, the soul of your dear Roberta home teach us to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom we ask you father of all mercies and God of all comfort to comfort those who are grieving the loss of their mother their grandmother their great grandmother and friend we pray for Bill and Debbie that they will find their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ the one whom Roberta put her trust in for we pray in Christ's name Amen. Well, today we celebrate uh, because we have uh, several uh, new people joining our church to get on board with our mission of our church. And as I call your names, please come up to the front and stand with me on the stage. Osei Ampong, August Kandra and Augie Balanka, Cheryl and Dale Schultz. And as they are 
making their way to the front, let me just say a quick word about why they're joining. Um, Joining for two reasons. Uh, When you're joining a church, you're making a statement. You're sending a message. You're sending a message that I don't only want to be a consumer of God's kingdom. I want to be a contributor to God's kingdom. I want to give back. I want to use my gifts. I want to engage. I want to get on board with the mission. Um, The second reason is just as important. In uh, Hebrews 13, 17, it teaches that Christians must submit themselves to the local body of a church. And so joining a church is an act of obedience to their Lord and Savior. And so those are two really good reasons to join. And if you are are visiting here, if you've been visiting here for a while, I invite you to talk to a pastor about what that would look like and why it's important. And uh, I'd like to invite all of you um, to spend some time after the service uh, in the Northex to get to know um, other people in the congregation. Uh, just to say a quick word to give you guys an introduction, Osei Ampong from Ghana. He is uh, studying at UD. You're getting a, you're a PhD right now in epidemiology, is that right? In the graduate program, yeah, absolutely. And the Blanca family, they're no strangers. Uh, They actually have family here already, and you've seen them around. Uh, You guys have relocated from Baltimore. You just took a position recently with Delaware Valley uh, Classical School as the art teacher. Uh, August, you're still uh, commuting from Baltimore, but we're really grateful to have you and your family here. And then there's Dale and Cheryl Schultz. Uh, Cheryl is no stranger because she's, pa- she's played a very critical and important role in our women's ministry for a number of years. Uh, Dale is a college professor and also, I understand, a very good Bible teacher as well. And so I invite you to get to know them after the service. But for now, uh, what I'd like to do is for you to affirm your membership vows. And so I'm going to state them. And if you affirm them, just say, uh, I do. Um, Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope except in his sovereign mercy? Do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Do you? Amen. Let me pray for you guys, and after I pray, you can go ahead and and be seated. Uh, Lord, we uh, do thank you for these families that have joined our church. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would help them to feel welcomed here. May they develop deep friendships and partnerships within the gospel with people here in this church. I pray that you would help them to explore and, and enhance their gifts to understand them and to use them to further your kingdom. Lord, use this church in the teaching and the discipleship and the preaching to grow them up in the knowledge of your grace and love for them, that they may demonstrate that love to others. And Lord, may they glorify you in all that they do. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. We continue on in worship by giving. And uh, we give our tithes and offerings for two different reasons. The first reason is is that through your generosity, we are able to carry out the mission of this church, to send out missionaries, to care for you, to complete our mission in the Newark uh, area. Um, But the second reason is even more important. We give, we are generous because God has been so generous to us. He spared no expense but gave up his only son so that we could be made rich in him. Those are the two reasons why we give. And so with that, let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer. Jesus, as we present to you your tithe and offerings, 
May what we give back to you be a demonstration of our gratitude for what you have so generously given to us. May it be used to further your kingdom, help the poor, and take your gospel message to the ends of the earth. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing King of Love on page eight in your bulletin.
Amen. Please be seated. And I apologize uh, for my voice. I'm still getting over something. Um, so we'll get through this together. If you uh, please turn with me in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to start at verse 18. I know it's not listed in your bulletin, but it's so critical to what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to start a little bit of, ahead um, of the passage. Um, if you remember last week's sermon, we talked about verse 21, which is about submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh, submitting to one another is, is part of a long sentence that starts at verse 18 that begins with the command to be filled with the Spirit. And when we're filled with the Spirit, what we'll find is that we are filled, our hearts are filled with gratitude toward God for what he's done for us. It's filled with joy that cannot be distinguished and our hearts are empowered to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so what we're gonna do is begin um, in the most re important relationship, which is the marriage relationship. And we're gonna see how... Uh, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ looks practically. And so read, please read along with me, starting at verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him now in prayer. Lord, as we talk about this passage, um, as we divide it up and talk about what it means for us who are married and for those that may be called to marriage, we pray that your Holy Spirit would, as the scriptures promise, fill us. That we would be filled with your spirit to have illuminated minds to understand what we're reading, but also soft hearts to be changed into the likeness of our Savior. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, years ago, um, several years ago, I went to seminary and I had to take uh, several classes on preaching. They called it homiletics classes. And all of our preaching professors generally taught us to begin with an introduction. An introduction, which is often a story or an anecdote, it's quite simply, the purpose of it is to grab the attention of the person, of the listener, and focus that attention on the passage. But today's passage is one of those passages that needs no introduction. It's one of the most read and one of the most talked about passages in the Bible. And for some, this passage is a hot button because they believe that what Paul says about wives submitting to husbands, it's archaic, it's controversial and, and, and backwards. For others who have experienced pain in their marriages, they're hoping that this passage can give them uh, uh, wisdom to navigate to a better place with their spouse. And for those who are single, when they look at this passage, they, and, and, they, and for those that are single that wanna be married, they're hopeful that they will one day have a marriage like what Paul is describing here. And so this passage needs no introduction. We're just gonna dive right into what this text says about marriage. And we're gonna talk about three things. The definition of marriage, the roles of marriage, and the implications for marriage. The definition, the roles, and the implications for marriage. Let's jump into the first point the definition of marriage, and I'm very grateful to multiple commentators for the insights that I'm gonna share with you in this definition. The first thing that we learn about marriage is that it is a covenant. It's a covenant. Verse 31, it says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now Paul is quoting what the, the passage that was read earlier by Dennis. Uh, it's, a it's the classic passage on marriage in the Old Testament. And that term, hold fast, in verse 31, it's a term that describes the uniting of two parties under a covenant. You know, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20, when God was describing his covenant relationship with his people Israel, he said, you shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and hold fast fast to him, and by his name you shall swear. So when I say marriage is a covenant, I mean that it is the strongest bond that, that can happen between two human beings, the strongest bond they can make with one another. It's a binding promise. And when Jesus, by the way, 
when he quotes that same verse in, in Matthew chapter 19, he actually, he adds another important element to this. He says, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So when two people join together, it's not just two people making a decision to commit to one another. It is God bringing them together in a very you know, profound way. So through this covenant, God is the one that's making the bride and the groom one. Now, what we must understand about this covenant, as one put it, is it's not just a declaration, a declaration of your present love, it's a promise of future love. It's not just a declaration of present love, but a promise of future love. Now, in my time as a pastor, you know, I've officiated several weddings through the years. And I, I've met with several couples, and, and on occasion, uh, a few of these couples, they want to write their own marriage vows. They feel like that, that would be more meaningful in the ceremony if it came from their heart. And so the first time that this happened, I had the couple submit their, you know, their written vows to me, and I read over them. And what I noticed about them is that they were wonderful descriptions about how they felt about each other in the present. You know, one went like this, you know, I love you. I want to be with you more than anything. You are more than I could ever ask for. Now, all these words, you know, they were beautiful, but they fell short of what a covenant truly is because they were only declarations of their present love for each other. A covenant goes further. A covenant makes a promise for future love. In other words, a covenant is making an appointment for yourself in the future with your spouse to say, I'm gonna be there no matter what, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, in the good times and the bad. You know, the covenant nature of marriage is very countercultural. It's very countercultural because the modern society has tried to reduce marriage down to a bond that is only as strong as your present passion or electricity or romance is in that present moment. But you know, any of us who have been in a marriage for any amount of time know that what inevitably happens is that the electricity and the passion that's so prominent in the beginning, it starts to fade when you get to know the person and their strengths and their flaws. You know, you begin to, you, know, you smell their breath on the morning and it's not very attractive, right? You know, you see their selfishness and their sin come out and oftentimes it comes out at your own expense. And that stuff does not invoke electricity and passion. And when you see these things and the electricity fades, all that you are left with is the covenant commitment that you have made to one another. And if it's strong, you have something far better than the infatuation and the electricity that you had in the beginning. You know, as one person put it, when over the years someone has seen you at your worst and knows you with all your strengths and flaws, yet commits him or herself to you wholly, it is a consummate experience. And get this, this is profound. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known but not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved, well, that's a lot like being loved by God, isn't it? That's what our souls need more than anything. That's what's meant by a covenant. Security unconditional love and acceptance from someone who truly knows you at your core. So that's one part of the definition of marriage. Here's the second part here. Marriage is also a pointer to a deep reality, a deeper reality. Now let me explain what I mean by that. After Paul, after Paul quotes Genesis 2 by saying the two shall become one flesh, he says in verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now, George Knight explains this verse better than anybody I've seen. And this is what he, ta this is what he says. You know, from the time that marriage was first giving, uh, given, at the beginning of time, there was a secret mystery hidden in the marriage union itself, Okay. 
Adam and Eve did not understand this mystery, nor did anyone else in the Old Testament understand this mystery. And the mystery was that marriage was designed by God from the beginning to be a picture or a parable of the relationship between Christ and his church. So the covenant, the union between husband and wife was to be an earthly picture of what would one day come about between Christ and his church. And because this wasn't known to people for many generations in the Old Testament, Paul called it a mystery. But now that the new, in the New Testament age, Paul reveals this mystery and it's amazing. In other words, when Paul wanted to tell the Ephesians about marriage, he didn't just hunt down for some helpful analogy and suddenly think, you know what? I know what to explain marriage to them. Let's, let me let them think about Christ in the church. That might be a good teaching illustration. It wasn't like that. It was much more fundamental than that. Paul saw that when God designed the original marriage in the beginning, he already had Christ and the church in mind. So let me put it this way. Your marriage, if you are in a marriage, your marriage is about something much bigger than you. Much bigger than you. Your marriage exists to tell the grand story of God's redemption of his people. That's why you're in a marriage. That is the number one reason why you're in a marriage. It's to tell that story. Or let me put it, let me put it another way. Whether you know it and whether you knew it or not, when you entered into the marriage covenant, it's like you entered into a drama or a play. You know, many of us have all like taken part in some uh, school play, right? You know, the purpose of this play was to retell the most important story in history, God's redemption of his people. Now, like any play, there are different parts, right? You have a director of the play, and that's God. Husband and, husbands and wives, you have each been given a role, a part in the play. You've been given a script to play that role out. You've been, you've been given direction. And from the moment you said, I do, in the, on the, in the wedding, God has expected you to act out your part in the play. Now, there is one very direct and clear implication for all of us who are married or wanting to get married. Marriage is first and foremost about God's glory before it's about your happiness. Marriage is first about God's glory than it is our happiness. Marriage is first and foremost about glorifying God by acting out this part in the play that he has given us, much more so than it is about my spouse meeting my emotional needs or making me happy. So let me ask you a question. How do you approach your marriage? What is first and foremost in your mind when you're thinking about relating to your spouse? Is the first thing on your mind how can I demonstrate Christ and his relationship to the church in my marriage and so glorify God in it? Or are you thinking about, man, am I really happy in this marriage? Is he meeting my needs? Is she meeting my needs? You're gonna approach your marriage in a very different way and get very different results depending on how you approach it. And don't get me wrong, God wants us all to have joyful and fulfilling marriages. But the way that he has designed marriage is that if your, first, if, if your approach is to first glorify him in retelling the story of Christ in his church, that's when happiness is gonna be thrown in. That's when joy is gonna be thrown in. It's like what uh, C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity, you know, you can focus on the temporal things of this earth or you can focus on the eternal things of heaven. Focus on heaven, you get the earth thrown in. Focus on earth and you miss both. And it's the same thing with marriage. If your marriage is all about focusing on getting my emotional needs met and making me happy, you're, gonna, you're not gonna glorify God. You're not also not gonna be happy. But if you focus first on glorifying him in your role, 
happiness gets thrown into. Happiness gets thrown into. So that's marriage. Marriage is a covenant, but it's also retelling the grand story of this, the greatest story ever told. We got to move on to the roles of marriage. <clears throat> now, before I get into the specifics of the roles of, mar- uh, roles of husband and wife, let me just say that both roles of husband and marriage, they fall under the heading of verse 21. You remember what is what verse 21, what does it say? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, right? And so right off the bat, we understand that in the biblical view, both the husband and the wife submit to one another. They just do it in different ways. They do it in different ways. So let's start with the wife. So verses 22 through 24 talk about the wife's, wife, you know, the wife's role here. Paul says in verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Okay, so simply put, the role of the wife is to submit to her husband as her own husband as the head, her own husband. So not, women are not to submit to all men, okay? Okay. That's what the Muslims teach in their religion. But they are to submit to their own husbands. Now, I'm going to get into specifics about what this submission looks like practically. But let me address some of the questions and concerns that that could come up for a woman here uh, from these verses. The first concern might be worded like this. Isn't male headship culturally limited to Paul's primitive time and culture? Haven't we evolved past this? Now, what I want to say about this concern is that some of Paul's teaching do have cultural limitations. You know, like, for example, Paul's teaching on head coverings in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they don't directly apply for today because hairstyle in the ancient world, it meant something different than hairstyle does today, okay? Today, it's mostly about fashion. Back then in ancient times, it was status, It also, uh, prostitutes wore their hair a certain way. And so he had to be very specific in that time and culture. Male headship in the family, however, is not culturally limited to their time. And the reason is listed in verse 23. The husband's headship over the wife is grounded in the basis of Christ being head of the church. Now, male authority in the family is not culturally limited to their time because Christ's authority over the church is not culturally limited to that time. Christ being head of the church is for all time. And so male headship in the family is a universal, it's a universal principle here. The second concern that might come up is, might be worded like this. Does submission mean that I must suppress my gifts, my talents, and my calling? You know, women might be asking this. Does submission mean that I might, that I have to suppress my gifts, talents, and calling? And the answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. And this is where it's helpful to understand the analogy of husband and wife to Christ and the church. You know, the church, think about it this way. The church does not suppress its gifts in order to submit to Christ, does it? Right? We don't sing softer We don't exercise less intelligence or seek to be less of an influence in the world when we submit to Christ. It's quite the opposite. The more that we submit to Christ, the more prominent we shine as a church, the more intelligent we become, the more influence we have in this world. And the same is true for a wife in a healthy marriage. In a healthy marriage, the husband should encourage the wife to shine with all of her gifts, with all of her talents, with all of her beauty. And I'm not talking about just being a homemaker here, okay? My uh, sister, Gina, and her husband are both in a, they're both believers. They both have a healthy Christian marriage. And under Joel's, my, my, my brother-in-law, Joel, 
under his headship, my sister Gina has flourished not only as a mother, but also in her professional career. You know, she's currently vice president and corporate controller of Corvo, which is a $10 billion company. She is one of the greatest leaders that I know personally. And part of the reason for her professional success is that her husband, Joel, encouraged and fanned the flame of her gifting and her talents so that she could realize her leadership potential. So ladies, you know, whether your gifting is upfront, like in leadership or teaching or things like that, or m- maybe it's more behind the scenes, like prayer or like service or like homemaking, you know, whatever your gifting is, when you submit to your husband, he should make you shine more, not less. So that's the second concern. There's a third concern. The third concern is, does submission mean that the wife is forced to do things that she doesn't want to do? And the answer is no. The answer is no. The Greek verb submit in verse 22, it's in the middle voice, which means to submit yourself. It's to submit yourself. In other words, submission is not something to be imposed on a woman, it's something to be offered up voluntarily by the wife, okay? It's to be completely voluntary. And this is very countercultural, okay? For the wife to voluntarily submit to the needs of her husband because we live in a culture that tries to brainwash us into thinking that to find your greatest satisfaction in this world, you must serve yourself. But here's what we see What we see here is that true fulfillment, true joy in a marriage is to be found in submitting to others freely, to serve others freely and voluntarily. And in this case, a wife submitting freely to her husband. Now, that being said, there are times that a wife is commanded not to submit. If the husband is doing things that are unbiblical, that are against God's law, if the, if the husband's doing something destructive to himself or the family, she is obligated by God to challenge his authority with the word of God, to stand up to him. Now, there's a whole lot more that we could say about the role of the wife, but we need to move on to the role of the husband. Now, the role of the husband we can find in verses 25 through 33, but it's stated very clearly in 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, there are two observations that I want you to make, I want you to notice about Paul's commands to husbands in their role, okay? And this is from verses 25 all the way down to 33. The first thing that you notice here is that Paul devotes more space to instruct husbands than he does instructing wives. Now, that's one thing you'll notice. Wives are given three verses of instruction, but husbands are given nine verses of instruction. Husbands are given literally three times as much instruction as wives are. And also notice this, husbands are told three times to love their wives in verses 25, 28, and 33. Now, I want to admit that this, what I'm getting ready to tell you is my speculation, but I believe that the reason that husbands are given more instruction and more repetition is because the husband has been given the tougher job here, and I'll explain why I think that. Notice that husbands are not only to love their wives in some vague, general way. No. Husband, uh, the husband is commanded to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's huge. Think about what Christ did to love the church. Christ had all the authority, all the glory, all the privilege in the universe. And what did he do with it? He set it aside to serve the needs of his bride, which is the church, to serve us. And he had to die in the process of doing that. So wives, think about it like this. Wives, if you have a hard time stomaching the idea of submitting to your husband, understand this. Husbands here are commanded to perform the submission of all submissions, okay? 
the submission of all submissions. They are, they're commanded as head of the family to die to his own preferences, to die to his own rights, to die to his own privileges, to serve you in your needs and your desires. He is given a greater command to, to submit to your needs. Now, so far we've been very high level here, so we need to get down into the practical nitty gritty about what this looks like in everyday life. So that, let's move on to point number three, the implications for marriage, okay? Now, there are four practical implications that I'd like to quickly cover here. First, what, is it practic- what does it mean practically that the husband is head of the wife? Well, it means two different things. First, it means that the husband should strive to set the example of running to Jesus for everything. Jesus is the source of life, the source of wisdom for all the family needs. He is the source of forgiveness when we make mistakes, when we sin. And so the husband should set a winsome example, not a domineering example, but a winsome example of running to Jesus for leadership and for wisdom and for forgiveness in all his life. You know, the husbands should be the lead repenters in their family. You know, husbands, if... Husbands and fathers, if you are not repenting in your family, asking for forgiveness and repenting so that your whole family can see it, it's not because you're not sinning against your family members. So you have to set the example for that. You have to lead the way in that. Then there's a second thing that headship means is that the husband gets the final say on decisions that are for the good of the family, okay? He gets the final say on the decisions that are for the good of the family. Now, at this point, some of you might be getting nervous because you can imagine your husband pulling the headship card to get his way all the time. But headship should never be used by the husband to gratify his own personal preferences, you know, to use an example that someone shared with me, you know, suppose that a husband and wife go out car shopping and they finally agree on the make and the model of the car, but they can't agree on the color. You know, he wants the car in blue, she wants the car in red, they cannot agree on it. And so the husband gently leans over to his wife and says, now, honey, remember Ephesians 5.22. You're supposed to submit now. You know, if your husband ever does that, wives, lean back over and say, now honey, remember Ephesians 5.25, you're supposed to die to me and all your preferences. And you know what? If she said that, she would be right. The husband, if he's following his calling as a husband, she should get the red car. She should get what she wants. The husband is called to die for her, and that's not just in a literal sense. He's called to die to his own preferences, to his own privileges, and put her needs and wants before his own. When headship is invoked, it should, so, so, so you know, when headship is invoked, it should never be just for his own personal preferences. It always must be for the overall good of the marriage or the overall good of the family, okay? So if there's a decision that needs to be made and and the wife and the husband can't agree on it and it really involves the health of the marriage or for some, you know, really big deal for the child's life, then he does get the tiebreaker. But you have to use that very sparingly and only in those situations. Now, we have to move on to the second Implication here, the roles here are unconditional. They are unconditional. You know, from time to time, you know, as, well, especially when I'm, when I'm counseling couples who are struggling in their marriage, what will happen is I'll hear from the wife, you know, I see what, that the word tells me, commands me to respect him, and I'm willing to do it once he deserves it. Or I'm willing to submit to him when he stops acting like a blockhead. And husbands do the same thing. They're like, you know, I'm willing to love my wife when she's lovable, 
when she's not so critical and so nagging and that sort of thing. And, and so what, what happens there in that marital breakdown is it's a standoff. And they're both saying, you know what? Um, I'll do my part when you do your part. And they just, it's, it's like a standoff. They just stay in their positions. And they're so focused on the other person's role reading, you know, wives are reading verses 25 through 33, and then husbands are reading the part about the wives in verses, you know, 22 through uh, 20, 21, um, 22 through 24, that they're missing their own parts. And what they think oftentimes is that, you know what, if I'm cold enough toward my spouse, they'll get back in the line. But what they don't realize is the opposite is often true. When you are resistant toward your spouse, when, you, when you're a wife that hold, withholds respect, that you disrespect your husband, or when you're a husband, you withhold love from your, from your wife because you know, you're waiting for them to make the first move, it, put, it makes them dig their heels down in their position all the more. It makes it harder for them to move towards you. And the, the mystery of the way that God has made the marriage, it's like the gospel. You know, did Jesus wait until you got in line before he initiated to you? No. He took the initiative. When we were in rebellion, when we were running away from God, that's when he came after us. And so it's, it's so interesting because God has built into the marriage when you're willing to love your wife, even though she disrespects you, or when wives are willing to respect their husbands, even though um, they're, not, they're not loving them well. It has a way of melting your spouse. You know, when, at times when I've been a blockhead in my marriage and my wife has loved me sacrificially, it melts me. It makes me feel ashamed of that, of the way I was acting. Not the opposite. And so you have to read your own mail first. What do I mean by that? Husbands, you got your hands full with the nine verses that are directed to you. Wives, you have your hands full with the three verses that are directed to you. Now, here's the thing. If you find that you are unconditionally following your role and your, your spouse is still not changing, well, that's when you need to come into my office. And we'll have a very discreet conversation and we can talk through it and find out what's going wrong there. But in regards to you, read your own mail and follow it before you start looking at your, other, at your spouse's mail. Okay, that's the second implication. There's a third implication. The third implication is that God uses your spouse to grow you spiritually. <clears throat> and we see that in verses 25 through 27, excuse me. Verses 25 through 27 tells husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, the word sanctify and washing with, you know, with water in verse 26, it's an obvious reference to baptism, but there's also another aspect and application that husbands will help their wives grow in spiritual radiance. And even though these verses say that husbands sanctify their wives, the principle is equally transferable to wives sanctifying their husbands. God uses spouses to sanctify spouses, to make us more holy in the marriage. You know, there's no, and here's the reason. There's no one that God has better positioned to sanctify you than your spouse because no one is closer than, to you, okay? No one has a better view when you let down your guard. No one has heard more of your true feelings about yourself and about others and about the world. No one has a better view on how you spend your time or how you spend your money. No one has a better view of your sins and your flaws. Now, often when we see the flaws and the sins of our spouse, they're not only observations, right? They're the very things that get on our nerves, aren't they? 
And oftentimes when we see these sins and we see these flaws, we use them as an excuse to be judgmental and critical toward our spouse. But what Paul says in verse 26 here, however, is that instead of being critical toward your spouse, bring the grace of God's word to bear in it. And when you bring God's word to your spouse in a loving way, reminding them of the cleansing grace of our Savior, it has the power to cleanse your spouse, to change your spouse, to clear up blemishes and spots, to make your spouse more radiant. Yeah, Paul Tripp probably put it better than anyone. He said, when your ears hear and your eyes see sin, weakness, or failure of your spouse, it's never an accident, it's never a hassle, it's never an inconvenience, it is always grace. Let me say that one more time. When, you're, when your ears hear or your eyes see the sin, weakness, or failure of your spouse, it's never an accident, it's never a hassle, it's never an inconvenience, it is always grace. Because you know why? Because when we see the sin and weakness and failure of our spouses, it is God giving us the opportunity to demonstrate to them the same forgiveness, kindness, and truth that Jesus gave us. And, the same, and that, that's true when you are on the sending end of truth. It's also true when you're on the receiving end of that truth. When your spouse brings truth to you, you must always be prepared to hear those words as if they're coming from God himself because they very well may be. Okay, so that's the third implication. There's one more implication that I wanna talk through and that's what we're gonna close on. The fourth implication is that we must have the power to be the spouses that God calls us to be. How will husbands get the power to love their wives in a sacrificial way? Or how will wives get the power to submit to their husbands as heads of the household? And we have to remember verse 21. Verse 21 says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And if you remember from last week, the power to submit came from being filled with the Spirit in verse 18. Let's go back and just do a, a brief review. You know, when the Spirit fills us, we are filled with a greater sense of God's love for us. Like in chapter three, you know, when Paul, he prayed that the Spirit would strengthen us in our, in our inner being to comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the great love of, of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. You know, when the, when the Spirit, he also fills us with a song of joy that cannot be extinguished by circumstances. And third, the Spirit, he fills us with gratitude because the Spirit reminds us of all the blessings that came to us, came because of the sacrifice of his Son. And when the Spirit fills us like this, power will spill over into your marriage to fulfill the role God has given you as husband and wives. A wife that is filled with the Spirit will want to submit to her husband as an act of worship toward her Savior, Jesus. Or a husband who is filled by the Spirit will want, will want to die to himself to serve, to serve his wife because Jesus literally died for him to serve his needs. So to lead healthy marriages, we have to ask and pray that the Holy Spirit fills us with Christ's love and joy and gratitude. Some of, you may, uh, some of you may be familiar with J. Robertson McQuilkin. He was the president, one of the presidents of Columbia International uh, University and Seminary years ago. Um, McQuilkin was right at the peak of his ministry and his reputation when he went through the experience of his wife being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And as the Alzheimer's disease progressed in his wife, she would become more and more desperate to be with her husband. So what, what would happen is he would go off to work, which was about a half a mile. He would go to the seminary, uh, which is about half a mile from where they lived. And what she would do is she would walk by foot to the seminary. 
uh, which was about a half a mile away. And when, we, when she arrived at the seminary, um, he would get somebody to escort her back to home. Um, but what would happen is that when the Alzheimer's got really bad, she would forget about the journey she made. And she would continue to walk to the seminary over and over again because, again, she forgot that she made the trip already. And on really bad days, she went like 10 times in one day. And that was until one night when um, McQuilkin was getting her ready for bed and he took off her shoes and her socks and he noticed that her feet were all bloody from all the walking that she did that day. And... As one biographer put it, as McQuilkin was washing her feet, he discerned a similar Christ-like act that he would have to perform for her. As the leader of his home, McQuilkin used his position, his understanding, and his authority for the sake of his wife, and he resigned from his position as president of that, of that uh, Columbia International in order to care for his wife full-time. And you might remember, if you're reading about this, a lot was made about this decision, not because McQuilkin made a big deal out of it, but because you know, an article was written about McQuilkin when he made this decision in Christianity Today, and when it was released, the response was overwhelming. You know, people called and wrote to McQuilkin. Couples renewed their marriage vows. Some of them restored marriages that had been broken for years. And McQuilkin, he was surprised at how big a deal people were making over his decision to care for his wife full time. And McQuilkin, who was suffering at that time with cancer, he was talking to his oncologist about the overwhelming response and how surprised he was. And he said, you know what, I, I don't understand you know, I want to care for my wife. Why is caring for my wife so moving to so many people? And the oncologist said to him, well, it's no mystery to me. In my profession, where I care for so many couples, it is not rare at all for a wife to give herself to care for her husband, but it is quite rare for a husband to give everything up to care for his wife. You know, it may be rare in the world, but may the church be different. You see, McQuilkin, he was not just a man operating out of his own strength. McQuilkin was a man whose heart was captured by the sacrificial love of his Savior. McQuilkin was a man who saw the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of of his Savior's love for him. And that served to power him to sacrificially love his, his wife. And friends, that power that was made available to him is also made available to all of us, isn't it? Look at the love of your Savior. Look at his sacrificial love toward you. Can you see it? Meditate on his love for you. And may that love empower all of us to be the wives and the husband that we're meant to be. Submitting to one another out of reverence for our Savior. Let's go to him now in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gospel, which is so practical for us. And I pray for every husband and wife here and every person that will be a husband or a wife here. And I pray that, that we all are so captured and so captivated by the love of Jesus for us that it empowers us to love our spouse unconditionally, to submit to our spouse unconditionally, and in so doing, tell the world about the greatest story ever, ever told of Jesus redeeming his people. And may in the process you get all the glory, and we pray all this in Christ's name, amen. Please stand for the closing song. Alone, my hope is found here.
benediction. And now may Jesus, who is the ultimate husband and spouse to us, its church, may he bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And all God's people said, amen.